He's clinical director and psychiatrist at Oxleeds. Uh, he's a uh, senior lecturer at UCL and King's. Uh, he's got great expertise in new care models and very fortunately in novel psychoactive substances, given the uh, subject of the uh, uh, talk uh, today. And he's also a member of the advisory council uh, uh, on the misuse of, of drugs. Now, um, Derek has also uh, recently won the award for the Psychiatric Educator of the Year, the Communicator of the Year. And so, uh, no pressure, uh, Derek. You know, the, um, uh, he, uh, I, fortunately, I know he'll give uh, a great talk. Uh, I've seen him do this talk before, and when he did it before, it was all you need to know about psychoactive substances in 10 minutes. It was 10 minutes before, so he's got an hour and a quarter today. Now, I was wondering why this is, and of course, as Derek will explain, the number of psychoactive substances is going up exponentially. So, 10 minutes turns into an hour and a quarter, and by the time of the International Congress next year, it'll be a whole day of talk. So, uh, Derek, it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome you. I know you're both informed and entertained, uh, and so uh, welcome uh, to the Western Women's Division and this President's Lecture. Thank you. Can you hear me at the mic? It's okay. I'm grateful for being invited up. Uh, as Adrian said, I, I do a few different things, a bit of the jack of all trades, but one of the things that interests me and has interested me a lot of the last few years has been the area of novel psychoactive substances, what people used to refer to as legal highs. And I became interested in it because I knew so little about it and it seemed to be a growing problem. And I'm, I'm curious, so what I'm going to do is maybe talk for about 45 to 50 minutes and then we can talk at the end. I'm interested in what it's like here. Because one of the interesting things for me with substance use is it's often variable from area to area. I live in East London and I work in South London and they're quite different in terms of patterns of drug use. And as Adrian mentioned, there's so many uh, novel psychoactive substances that it varies hugely. <coughs> There are now at least 700 identified novel psychoactive substances. There's a colleague of mine in the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. He uses what's called web crawler technology to look at this. And he thinks that we're out by an order of magnitude. He thinks that there are about 7,000 of them, and we've identified about 700. And that raises a really interesting challenge for us. So when I was in medical school, there were six drugs, or thereabouts, cannabis, cocaine, ecstasy. And it, even then, I wasn't a substance misuse specialist, I'm not now, and it's hard to keep on top of it. And when there's 700 and possibly 7,000, that feels an impossibility. And I think there's a danger for us that we think, no way, that's, that can't be my thing. And that we think about it in terms of substance use services. Are any of you substance use clinicians? One, two? And I, I, again, I'm not sure what it's like here, but I'm guessing like lots of the country services are being cut in substance use. It's a real challenge because it falls under social care's budget. We can't rely on substance use services. And even if we could, I think it's our problem. So I don't think we can say, this is not my area, this is not my expertise. We work with people. In the same way we can't say, I'm not interested in housing, I'm not a housing officer. We have to take into account the employment and the uh, home situation of the people we look after. And it's the same, drugs are part of society, our patients are part of society, so we need to know. But the good news in the sense of my talk, as Adrian said, I did it in 10 minutes with 700 drugs. We've all had coffee though, right? <laughs> in one way, it doesn't matter so much if there's 700 or 7,000. What I'm going to try to do over an hour is give you a framework for assessing them. And my basic pitch to you is, you already know the 700 drugs. You may not know you know them, but I'll try to convince you you know them, and I'm going to give you a functional framework to break them down into four major groups, and I'm going to put it to you that you kind of know them already. So at the end of the talk, what I'd like is, you have a sense that it's not so confusing. I do know this field a bit. It is important for me. 
And at the end of it, you won't say legal highs anymore and you won't say NPS anymore because that in itself will be inadequate. And my hope is you'll go back to your teams thinking, we need to talk about this and we need to think about what we're doing locally. One of the big things we've been doing in South East London is being psycho-ed with our staff and with our patients. We sit down, we have groups, and we tell them what we know and what we don't know, and we get them to tell us about what's happening and what they're seeing. So I'm going to break the talk into kind of three major areas. How did it come to this? How come when I was in medical school there were six drugs and now there's 700 or maybe 7,000? The bulk of the talk is in the middle where I'm going to try persuade you that we can functionally break this into four groups that make sense to us. Your biochemist will find exceptions, but you know, if I can cover 99% of 700 drugs in an hour, I'm doing okay with it. And then the final part is pragmatic. So, so what? What are you going to do? What happens if someone comes back into your team and they're psychotic from using spice? What happens if someone develops serotonin syndrome? So we'll think about how we might assess it and apply it. Some of this comes from, I'm promoting my own work here, but we did a couple of papers with BMJ last year, and we got the cover of the BMJ, which is good for my ego, but it was also kind of telling us something which I found really instructive. There's so much out there in the public domain about legal highs. I'm pretty sure I could open a newspaper today and find a story about it. So the Queen mentioned it in one of her speeches. And yet, there's nothing out there for us. I don't know if you've had educational resources on it. I mean, these things are really common now. 700 drugs, there's a lack of information. It's one of the reasons we did the papers, kind of clinical primers. So if you want to have a look, they're aimed at ge generalists in a sense. If you're, into, so if you're a substance use doctor, maybe it's of interest too, but I think if you're not a substance misuse, we kind of pitch the papers at you. So how did it come to it? And Adrian alluded to this. So this is the synthesis. See, the point is working. You could, the synthesis of NPS, it's going from about 2005, and this really started to kick off to about 2015. You don't need to worry about the detail. I mean, you can see what's happening. That's going up. To the point now, about 100 new drugs a year. 100 new drugs a year that are being identified. So again, in the ACMD, the Home Office work, there's an argument that we're missing this by a factor of 10. Two new drugs a week, and you think, how do we keep up with it? There, they're broken down into biochemical classes. We don't need to worry about it. So what happened? Some years ago, a phenomenon began to occur that hadn't been seen before. And a biochemist, an evil biochemist, I'm going to cackle a lot. They get an existing drug, maybe MDMA, ecstasy. And they would biochemically modify it. I don't know exactly how they do it because I'm not a biochemist, but they would change it. They'd add on a carboxyl group or an oxygen molecule. And they would say, this is no longer ecstasy. That's ecstasy. I've modified it. Ecstasy's illegal. This is legal. This is a legal high. And they would sell it. And they typically sold it in things called head shops, which you, I'm sure you have here. And after a while, the government would say, wait a second. That's pretty much like ecstasy. And they would ban it. And then the chemist would get that drug, and they'd change it again. And they'd do something else. But again, maybe they add on another carbon atom. And they would say, this is neither ecstasy nor recently banned substance X. This is novel psychoactive substance Y. <coughs> ecstasy is banned. Substance X is banned. This is a legal high. And they would sell it. And they'd sell it in a head shop. And after a while, the government would say, wait a second. That looks like those two drugs. And they would ban it. Now, this went on for a few years until the government finally said, I think I see what you're doing. <laughs> There's a pattern here. And we'll come on to it. So in 2016, they brought out the no Novel Psychoactive Substance Act. Now, I've got to be really clear. I'm, I'm mindful of being recorded here. I'm a member of the Advisory Council on Misuse of Drugs. I do not represent the opinions of the Home Secretary or the Home Office. Yeah, so why you laugh is a mystery to me. So this is entirely my personal opinion on some of this stuff. So the ACMD did not recommend that the, MP the Novel Psychoactive Substance Act was brought into place. But we are answerable to the, the way it works is we're answerable to the, the Home Secretary. Our job is to provide unbiased best advice. So the recent thing you might have seen that the ACMD did, which we'll talk about in a little while, we'll talk about the complexity of drugs, we made a recommendation for the rescheduling of cannabis for medicinal use. So it was an ACMD recommendation, the Home Secretary accepted that. But the Home Secretary has it within their power to accept or reject our advice. Home Secretary and the Home Office are answerable to you, not to us. So this went on over a few years, and then the Novel Psychoactive Substance Act banned everything. And it's a really interesting piece of legislation. It's unique around the world. 
All drugs, existing or future, are banned. At the moment of creation, a new drug is presumed and prescribed. If you make a new drug today, it's banned automatically. And that applies for therapeutic drugs. If you make a new antidepressant, it's banned, because it's psychoactive. And what you need to do with that is you apply for an exemption. So everything is banned. And people thought, okay, kind of. That definitely did something. And what happened was there was a large shutdown of the head shop. So if you've seen them before, these were the environments in which these drugs used to be sold. So now if you want, so if my son wanted to get drugs, which I hope it doesn't, but if he wanted to, he can no longer go into a head shop. So if my son wants to get drugs, which again I hope he doesn't, he now has to go into a field to meet a guy on a BMX bike with a knife in his pocket. So it, it has done something, it's shifted, and what we'll talk about today is the challenge of drugs markets. You cannot get rid of an illegal drugs market, and we'll talk about why. You can decriminalize drugs possession, and you can have a legalized drugs market, but all you ever do is you push things around a bit. And the question for us is, what is it we're trying to achieve? So question for you with the Novel Psychoactive Substance Act, I'm gonna give you till the end of the lecture, I'm going to give you all of recorded time and every society that's ever existed. And my challenge is for anyone here across that time span to give me one example when a government banned people from doing something and people said, okay, stop the time. Right? All of recorded history, every society that's ever been. So the law stopped the open sale of it and banned them all. And there's lots of interest, so we've given talks to different countries or interests in the model. So that came in. So we've had this huge explosion. Let's have a look at NPS at the moment. Now, that's probably a bit uh, small at the back. I'll just talk you through some major points, and I'm very happy for my slides to be given out of there. I've used to you, I'm delighted for you to have them. But there's some data there on some common drugs that of use. So the top left, again, I appreciate it's a little small for you to see. Top left is cannabis. This is our most commonly consumed drug. We've got cannabis, cocaine, ecstasy, amphetamines, opioids, and we'll come down to NPS. And what this graph does, it shows the prevalence of use in the last year, it breaks it down by younger people to older people, male to female, it gives a bit of information. And cannabis is of course the most commonly consumed drug. So about a quarter of adults will say they've ever had cannabis. And that's a really interesting first point. I, I, I do some work for a charity on drug harms, and we go into schools and we talk to children. And again, I like giving the talk to you. One of the things that fascinates me about drugs is that it's a real lack of resources. I, I couldn't do pro bono stuff in schools because no one else is doing it. And again, I don't know what you have here, but really limited resources. And one of our first messages to children is, three quarters of people will never take any drug in their entire life. Three quarters of people will never take a drug. And we'll talk about drug consumption patterns in the next slide. Because I think, you know, when you're at school, it's, it's like sex. It just feels like everyone else is getting it. So it just feels like drugs, sex, rock and roll, and I'm not doing it. So it's something about normalizing the fact that most people don't take drugs. Anyway, about a quarter of the cannabis. And down at the bottom, we have NPS. And we get an interesting phenomenon, and this has been shifting over the last few years. About 8% of the population will say that they have ever tried a novel psychoactive substance. About 3% will say they've done so in the last year. But what's been really interesting with the NPS has been the pattern of consumption, and it's changed over the last five to 10 years. It's been a really interesting shift. NPS have two interesting characteristics, by and large, it varies from drug to drug. One is, they're often very, very cheap. And the second is, they're often very hard to detect. Can you think of a cohort of people who don't have much money and don't want to get caught consuming drugs? I want you to think about your clinic, or your wards, or your prisons. It's the people we see, people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, people in psychiatric wards, People in schools, they are very, very cheap, and they're very, very hard to detect. And that will come on to an interesting thing. We'll talk in a minute about legalization or decriminalization of drugs. So the, in a sense, there could be a bit of moral panic. Our N700 drugs, that must be everyone taking them now. It's not, but it's in very specific parts. Now, I will mention later on, some of the novel stimulants drugs like methadrone, they are in what we call a drug party scene. But a lot of these are hitting very vulnerable people. And they're very, very potent drugs. People you really don't want taking this stuff. But again, to contextualize a little bit, this is a graph of prevalence of drug consumption in the UK. You don't need to worry about the detail. Have a look, if you're on that slope, which way are you gonna fall? You're falling down. On the left of that graph is when I was in university, 
and write the graph for people in university now. Drug consumption has fallen in the UK in the last decade. Now you can nuance that a lot, so of course you might want to break that down by drug type and population, but drug consumption has gone down. I find it interesting with my students at King is they're much more clean living, than, certainly than I like to remember, maybe I'm nostalgic, I'm nostalgic when I was in university. But I think in terms of alcohol consumption too, so we can panic about drug use. And here's another really important graph. So I said to you a few minutes ago, three quarters of the population will never take a drug ever. Let's focus on the other quarter. One quarter of the population, so we do a survey and we get full honest replies, one quarter who say, yes, at some point in my life, I have taken an illicit drug. So we're excluding alcohol here. And then we try and do, so we've got a quarter of the population, we ask, what does that look like? This graph, we don't have to worry too much about all the writing in. This is how common you take it. So on the left of that is very, very common, that's every day. And on the right is infrequent. So the right way is once or twice a year. By far the most common way of the course of the people, the minority of people who consume drugs, the most common way they will take it is once or twice a year. That's not that common. And then we get next most common is once every couple of months. And we always think if this is a worry, this is what we see every day, but that's actually a really small percentage of people. Now, of course, this is a problem, we're more likely to see, but we have to see context with drug use and drug harms. And that takes me on to, I often when I'm giving talks about drugs, and again, the substance use specialists here may, may disagree, or any of you may disagree, I tend to give three messages, and I find that oftentimes we can have difficulty assimilating all three simultaneously, because people often don't like one of the messages. And the first message for me is, most people who take drugs are not particularly harmed by them. And that's an uncomfortable truth for lots of people. That's an uncomfortable truth for lots of clinicians. You won't see it. They take it occasionally. I'm not recommending it. You know, my advice to you is don't drink, don't smoke, don't take drugs, exercise three times a week and be in bed by nine o'clock by yourself. It's my guidance to you. That's not everybody does that, unfortunately. But lots of people aren't harmed, but people tend not to run into a GP and say, I've taken drugs, it didn't really harm me, in fact, I enjoyed it, what should I do? <laughs> and you won't get that in your clinic either, people don't report with that. Again, I'm not recommending it, but you've got to be able to hold that truth, most people are not harmed by it. Of course, some people are harmed, and the harms are variable. I always have a bit of a pyramid model in my head, so at the bottom is the majority who take drugs, which I don't recommend, like I don't recommend drinking alcohol, who are not harmed by it. And at the very top, the sharp edge, are probably people going to substance use services, people who are dying from it, people with very severe harms. And underneath that are lots of different variants. So <coughs> one of my best friends, if he was here, he's quite strongly anti-cannabis. He, I'll be careful, it's being recorded here about how much information I so He's doing well, but one of the things he would say that from his late teens into his mid-twenties, about ten years, he was smoking quite a bit of cannabis, and I, it really impacted his motivation and his drive. So it didn't directly harm him, he never went psychotic, he didn't develop respiratory problems, but at a time when the rest of us were going to university, he didn't. And then he lost a decade of his life. I mean, lost food, lost opportunities, and quite subtle. And then above that, we're thinking about psychological and physical harms and getting to the very top. So, Drug harms vary. It depends on the drug, we'll talk about that. It depends on how one consumes the drug. And it depends on the person. So we all know that person who's got two pints of beer and wants to take on the world. You'll see them tonight, they're everywhere. So it does depend on the person as well. So most people are not harmed. Some people are, depends on the drug, the method of consumption, and the individual. And for some, they may be therapeutic. So there's lots of interest. This is why the ACMD made recommendations about medicinal cannabis. I mean, I've got to be honest, I, I think this stuff is wildly oversold. And I think it's got to be a huge disappointment from the public. There's a real sense that we have the world's best medication, but we've not told you about it until now. And it's in the back, we don't want to release it. And it's natural and it's great. I mean, I think cannabis-based products will help some people, like all drugs help some people. They will partially help others and will cause side effects because if they didn't do that, they would be unlike every other drug that's ever existed. But there is interest. There's enough data out there to suggest we should be looking at it. So you can argue the other way around. With cannabis, you can say we don't have enough good science. And part of the ACMD's recommendations, one was to get treatments to people, and the second was to facilitate more research. 
And then there's other stuff, uh, MDMA, uh, ketamine, psilocybin, there's lots of interest at the moment. So there are three things we've got. the one hand, some people do it for fun and are fine. Some people are harmed, and for some people it's therapeutic. So single compounds can do that. And we need to be able to hold those messages. But we certainly, with an orbit of the world, we're getting lots of this stuff coming through, these anxieties about the novel psychoactives. And it often comes in a couple of ways, depending on your clinical background. If we take my model, and I'll come on to legislation in a minute, but one of the things the government forgot with the legislation, drug dealers don't always follow the law. I don't know if you knew that. Not always. And they're not all based in the UK. So it's not all, I mean, maybe post Brexit we'll have a brand new blooming industry in, in uh, drug consumption here or synthesis, but it, it's coming internationally. And we're getting, occasionally a chemist will get a drug, they'll change it, and it'll be really dangerous. So sometimes you add on an oxygen molecule and you sell it, and people start to die. And so sometimes you've seen this sort of thing. I don't know if you remember these Superman pills that were going around the south coast. A batch came in, I think it's in Brighton, and a whole lot of university students ended up in hospitals some died. And the other thing we're seeing a lot, depending on your part of the world, if you're inpatient or forensic, seeing this, the novel cannabinoids coming into the wards. So here's the legislation. So it certainly did a thing. And, and again, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an open question. There's no right or wrong to it. I'm always curious with the audiences taken in a sense. I, I can see arguments for decriminalization and for legalization and again mindful that these are entirely my own opinions and not represent any other organization for which I might work at any time. I'm sympathetic to those arguments. I'm sympathetic to decriminalization. But I want you to think about it. So of course the different things. Decriminalization means that the police are no longer interested. So decriminalization means if the police stop you and you have drugs in you, they're not going to do anything. Legalization means you've got to buy it through uh, a registered resource, like through a shop or an online thing. So that's different. That's where it's actually promoted, it's perhaps the wrong word, but you can get it through legitimate channels. Decriminalization is still buying through drug dealers. But I want us to think about that. So I sometimes ask an audience, in fact, I'll do it now. Who's in favor of, it's not a trick question, but who's in favor of decriminalization? You're all quite conservative. It's Friday. <laughs> Okay, so keep your hands up. In favor of decriminalization? For children. Yeah, thought so. So it's up for us, you mean. So we can get organically grown cannabis flown in first class from Seattle, watered with Himalayan springs, but your kids have to get scum, right? Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? So, yes for me, yes for my friends, no for children. Now, you, you can throw that back at me about alcohol. So, we also have very vulnerable people who will never be legalized for And there's another example I'm going to give to you about it. I look, there was a drug came out, um, I think it's about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. It's a novel, it was a synthetic, what's called a cathinone, it's called monkey dust. Now, the, the name, the media just jumped on this, monkey dust. This is the downfall of Britain. What's this monkey dust stuff? And it caused a bit of a moral panic. We were on, there was a TV debate, I was asked to go and be part of it. I was on with David Nutt and we were arguing against someone with a very different world view. The person we were arguing with seemed to be of the opinion that the problem was we weren't hanging enough people and shooting enough people. And if only we tripled the number of prisons, we could really solve this drug thing. And, and the, the, the debate just started off with, should monkey dust be category A? So this is, it was Victoria Darbyshire, that was her question, is it should it be category A? Is this the problem with it? I'll tell you a key characteristic of monkey dust, the single most important component of monkey dust. It costs two pounds. I've just arrived, I don't know what it's like, I'm going back home, I'm not going out to, to sample the nightlife of Solihull. I'm guessing I don't get far with two pounds in the bunker. I mean, what can you get for two pounds? And that's the key characteristic of monkey dust. There are many, many people who will come and say, I have this much, what can I get? Now, if you have a legalized drug market, which again, I'm not intrinsically against, that's of no use to that person. Because, say what you like about your drug dealer, you don't pay tax. They're good like that. In a legalized market, you've got to pay tax. There's always a group of people who can't afford to pay. So again, I think we've got to think, there's always an argument, what's the right thing to do with the drugs market? Should we decriminalize, should we legalize? I think it's really complicated. I think there are valid arguments. I'm not saying we should ignore it, but you've got to be careful. You push the pieces around. 
I always try and approach it the other way from a health perspective. I think if, if, you, if you're trying to legalize it, you're looking the wrong way down the barrel of a gun with it. You can't build walls high enough and prisons big enough to stop people taking drugs. People take drugs. So your question is what type of society do you wish to live in, in terms of the rules and codes it has, and what type of support do you wish to offer for the people who will be harmed by drugs? I think that's a more sensible way to consider the problem. So there, there's an example. What's that stuff? It's like guarantee, not just offset, I guarantee we could do a little field trip off to my top. If we finish early, we'll go do it, we'll all walk around together. Within 30 seconds, one of us will find one of them within the grounds of the hospital. Guarantee it. You see them everywhere. Did someone say yes, no, they found some under the table? <laughs> we got samples for everyone going on. But it really bugs my wife. My son is really good at spotting these things. <laughs> I would say he's being educated. He goes, look, that's noble psychoactive substances. So is that stuff illegal? Is that Amazon. Um, you guys know as well as I do, multinationals would not skirt the law just to make money. So it must be legal. <laughs> So it's Derek's Amazon, I did some research for this talk. Amazon will sell me nitrous oxide. What's going on there? It's used in for whipping cream. It's always someone who knows, yes, for whipped cream. I mean, I can think of far more dangerous things to do with whipped cream, but that's all legal. So if you want to make whipped cream, that's fine, and that's your own business. So you can buy it to make whipped cream. You can't buy it to get high. Now, once, I don't know if whatever the guy is, it, Jeff Bezos, I'm sure he doesn't phone you up to go, how's the cream going? <laughs> lick, lick something in front of me, I want to hear some noise. And you're not having a good time, are you? So, you could do it, of course, but this goes back to the issue about what you want to do with drug laws. Amazon is a really stupid way to buy drugs, to get high. Buying drugs is really stupid, just so the camera don't, so again, don't buy drugs. <laughs> because once again, I'm Amazon Prime, so the postage is free for me. <laughs> That's but I've got to pay tax. So once again, you've got this interesting challenge with it. And other loopholes with it. There's, there was an interesting, uh, a year or two ago, this guy went to Glastonbury. I don't know if you saw the story. He was stopped. He had two suitcases of canisters of this. And the police said, what are you doing? And he said, ah, oh, making whipped cream. <laughs> And they said, where's the cream? <laughs> he forgot the cream. <laughs> he remembered his two suitcases, nitrous oxide, from Glastonbury. He forgot the cream. And they prosecuted him, and he won. Now, they actually, they, they challenged him, went to a higher court, and he lost. So if the police catch it, if you're having a good time with it, you're in trouble. Well, unless you're having a good time with whipped cream, I'll let you away with that. Okay, it brings up another interesting part with the law. If I have a novel psychoactive substance and it's in my pocket, if I've got something here, a novel cathinone, am I breaking the law? If I take it out and I inject it in my arm, am I breaking the law? I'm not. If I give it to you, I'm breaking the law. Or if I start synthesizing, I've got around a little laboratory I've to show you, if I make it, on breaking the law. So another interesting thing that happened here was the Novel Psychoactive Substance Act prohibits manufacture and distribution. It does not prohibit possession or consumption. And that's interesting, and I'll tell you why that is, because that was 2016, and that shows society shifting. So the Misuse of Drugs Act, which covers other drugs, it's 1971, possession is a crime. The thinking in that 2016, and I think we're probably sympathetic to it, was well, you can see what the legislation is doing. Go after the drug dealers. Go after the drug manufacturers. Don't punish drug consumers. Maybe let's take it as a health problem. And you can kind of see what they did, but it opened up another loophole. Now, normally when I give this talk in school, at this point, I give the back row, I can see, and I know what's happening. And eventually a hand goes up, and someone says, my friend wants to know something. <laughs> so at this point, what do people want to know? Someone has spotted a loophole. Now the next slide, I'm going to do this, so that's kind of how we got here, and the bulk of my talk in the middle is trying to describe the classes to you. And from my point of view, the next slide is the single most important slide of the talk. I'm going to try to capture the, the, the niece of this area from my point of view. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe four, I mean, it's kind of a thought experiment, I'm going to describe four friends of mine. It's a hypothetical, 
I don't have four friends, but I want you to imagine them. And they're outside, and I'm going to bring them in one at a time. And we're going to we'll get a chair brought up, and we'll have a chat with them. My first friend that I'm going to bring in uses ecstasy quite a bit. Most weekends. It's not something he tends to plan. He'll go out and have a few drinks out in the nightclub scene. It's often there. If it's in his way, and it often is, he'll take it. So we're going to have a chat to him. I think it's having a bit of an impact on him. He often crashes out into Monday, Tuesday. I think there's a little bit of depression tied in. He's not, he's not a brilliant state. I mean, which came first, chicken and egg? But I want us to talk to him. Now, you have a working model in your head at the moment. It's a stereotype, you know that. But you already have an algorithm of the things you're beginning to think about. Even if you're not a substance use person, you're thinking about the types of questions I would want to know. I've just given you a little thumbnail and you're thinking about it. So keep him in mind. My second friend I want us to talk to smokes cannabis. And for better or for worse, I think for worse, he smokes quite heavily. He smokes every single day. I think it's really having an impact on his mental health. He's quite paranoid. We're going to have to go a little bit gently with him. He's not in great space. He's been in the hospital with it before. We'll have a chat to him. Now, once again, you have a working model in your head. You have an algorithm of things you want to ask. And it's very different from the first one. So keep those two in mind. They're different sets of questions you've got at the moment. And again, it's a working model. There's lots more you want to get. It might not be your area, but you've got a very different pattern. My third friend who's going to come in uses heroin. And I, th I think significantly, he injects heroin. It's going to take us a little while to get him in. He's lost part of his leg with it. He's really in a vulnerable, frail state. We're going to have to sit him down here. It's going to take us a while. Now, you have a third model in your head, and it's different from the first two. It's different from the guy using ecstasy, and my friend is lost cannabis. And my final friend, if he hangs around long enough, uses LSD. He uses it two or three times a year. I don't think it's a particularly big thing. If we ask him, he'll talk. I've told him why we're here. He'll tell us about it if we ask him. But it's not a big issue. I'm not sure how much of an impact he has. Now, four friends, four working models, and you know them already. You have different algorithms in your head. It's no matter what your specialty is. They are the four groups of NPS. This is the way we're going to function. You can do it different ways. No, there's no single agreed way to break NPS. You can do it biochemically, etc. But we found a really helpful way to functionally break them this way. And the first group are NPS stimulants. These are novel drugs that are like ecstasy. So if I bring someone in now, from now on, we're not going to say NPS. We're now going to follow on with the subcategorization. I'm going to say NPS stimulants, NPS cannabinoids, NPS depressants, NPS hallucinogens, because that's really important. Had I told you earlier on, I have four friends outside, they all take drugs when you see them. You would rightly tell me that's inadequate information. You'd say, that's really important. You should have told me that guy was injecting heroin. That's really different. That other guy just takes acid twice a year. It's really important. So we're going to subcategorize an NPS stimulants, drugs, novel drugs like ecstasy. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. There's several hundred of them. The second category are NPS cannabinoids, drugs that are like cannabis. They are very different from novel drugs that are like stimulants. In the same way, ecstasy is very different to cannabis. Our third group are NPS depressants. We'll subcategorize them into opioids and benzos. So we'll come on to them in a few minutes. And our last class are NPS hallucinogens. And again, we'll break them. These last two we won't fun, uh, focus so much on. We can break them down into dissociatives and psychedelics. I'm going to focus most on the first two, because they're the two you're going to see. You don't tend to, unless you're, if you're in a substance use service, you will see people with opioids. You're going to see it less often. So I'm going to focus on them. That's a really key first step. Can we get the functional group of NPS? This covers 99% of it. As I said, it's a functional model. There are other ways to do it. I find it's a really helpful way. Now, we have a couple of key differences that we need to take into account. The first is there are several hundred drugs in most of the classes. So when I say stimulants, in the old days, we had three types of stimulants, which we'll talk about. We had ecstasy, amphetamines, and cocaine. Now we have several hundred of them. So there's a wider range. Some of them are probably going to be quite mild. Some of them are going to be strong. We've got a wider range. The cannabinoids, we have several hundred cannabinoids. Not just cannabis anymore. With different range of effects and harms. 
The last two classes, there are fewer of them. There's certainly two dozens and scores of them, of the novel depressants and the novel uh, hallucinogens. The second thing that's really different is the method of consumption. All bets are off. So if I said to you ecstasy, you're thinking tablet. If I say cocaine, you're thinking snorting it. If I say to you heroin, you're thinking something either smoking or injecting it. You have well-established models where have people consume the classes. Now, you need to ask. The novel stimulants is a problem would arise in the instance of HIV in the UK that's partly driven by an increase in injecting novel stimulants. People who traditionally don't inject those drugs. The novel cannabinoids, you can drop them on your eye. You can put them on paper. There's lots of different ways you need to ask because we're well aware of this. For the obvious uh, distinction is whether or not people inject drugs or don't, because of all the physical harms and vulnerabilities. So now someone's taking a stimulant like ecstasy, you now need to ask, how do you consume that? Because of course, if they're injecting it, your risk profile hugely changes. So we've got our four classes, stimulants, cannabinoids, depressants, and hallucinogens. And our difference underneath is we accept a much bigger range in each of them. And we need to ask now, how do you take that drug? So what we'll do is we'll talk for about 10 minutes or so on four classes. I'm going to focus on the first two because they're the ones you will see more of. The first ones are stimulants. So our traditional drugs here were cocaine, amphetamines, and ecstasy, MDMA. And they work in your brain, they increase serotonin, more adrenaline, uh, and dopamine. And I've color coded them, I don't know if that's clear to you, but I'll show you why in a second. But amphetamines is purple and ecstasy as blue. The more purple drugs here are more dopaminergic. So amphetamines are quite a dopaminergic drug. If you've seen people using speed, they get a much more pushed picture on this. That pushing psychosis type picture. So you can see it there, they're euphoric, talkative, disinhibited, agitasis. And of course, because they're pro-dopaminergic, they're prone to cause psychosis. And they're prone to create more physiological addiction. It would make sense with a dopaminergic compound. At the other end of the stimulant scale, we have very serotonergic drugs, and ecstasy is our traditional example in this class. They're what are called intactogenic, and what that means is you feel loved up. So that's why people take ecstasy, it's very intactogenic, very serotonergic. So with our existing drugs, we go from very dopaminergic, like amphetamines, to very serotonergic, like ecstasy. So there's a range of it, and people will know the difference. If you have someone who ordinarily takes ecstasy, and you give them amphetamines, they will know the difference. They might be delighted, and they might take both of them, but they will be able to tell them apart and different physiological effects. It's the same with our novel psychoactive stimulants. We have several hundred drugs now, and they will go from very dopaminergic, like amphetamines, to very serotonergic, like ecstasy, with lots of room in the middle. We now have hundreds of them. The problem at the moment is trying to get individual data on a single drug is really hard. So I think the takeaway message is they're going from very ecstasy-like to very amphetamine-like. This table here is just to illustrate. So don't worry about the detail. We've got a list of NPS stimulants here. So we can take the bottom one there, butylone. It's not particularly dopaminergic. It's very strongly serotonergic. That NPS stimulant would be very like ecstasy. And we take another example up here. Uh, where are we? Like a dopaminergic one. We take the cathinones. The cathinones tend to be very strongly, there they are. Cathinones are very strongly dopaminergic, very weakly serotonergic. So the cathinones tend to be very much like amphetamines. And of course, what you'll notice there is most of them are somewhere in the middle. So they go between quite like ecstasy, quite like uh, amphetamines to somewhere in the middle. So we get this range of effects. We now have several hundred drugs. And as you might expect, the more dopaminergic are more likely to cause addiction, more likely to cause psychosis. But a lot of the risk with this class is from impulsive, stupid behavior, like alcohol. So it was a bad idea two hours ago after a bottle of wine suddenly seems like a thing to do. And it's often the case here, so people are getting into more vulnerable positions. The names often end with on. So methadrone is a classic example of an NPS stimulant. So that's one of the ones that it is actually still quite popular in a party drug scene, where I said a lot of the um, NPS are used with socioeconomically disadvantaged people. There's a, a difference with this. This is a part of the party drug scene. 
white form of availability. So there's an example, there's a powder, and you can imagine, so that can be consumed in different ways. The, 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 the language use of drugs often varies from place to place. Certainly where I am, people will, will refer to bombing. Bombing means getting the powder in, in paper and then you swallow it. You can clearly, you can inject that, you can snort it, insert it rectally, it's loads of things you can do. I don't know if you can see on it, it says on the packet, not for human consumption for research purposes only. And that's where they had another name early on. They're sometimes called research chemicals, or bath salts. But this was an early attempt by drug dealers to circumvent the law. And what they were doing here was they, they, they were selling to people saying, well, I presume you're carrying out some sort of chemical experiment in your home laboratory. The experiment, of course, being how high off my face can I get from this powder? But the drug dealers say, whoa, 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 that's not why I sold it. I thought you were a chemist like me. And you know, you can do it too. I'm sure if I go to a news agency, wait train station, they will sell me cigarette skins and a bomb for novelty value. So they're just, they're, it's up to you what you do with them. I would say to you, if you're interested in becoming a drug dealer, that defense is not particularly strong in law. And there are many examples of people being convicted despite saying that they were amateur chemists. On to the second class. So that's one class there, just to capture that again. So we've one large class of NPS drugs, NPS stimulants, drugs going from very dopaminergic like amphetamines to very serotonergic like ecstasy. You need to know how people take it. It's a really important thing of that class. And there's a thing called a chemsex scene. I'll let you Google chemsex yourself. Don't do it on a trust iPad or phone. And there's a, there's a party scene where people are injecting stimulants, keep going partying over long periods of time. I go, uh, I go running at the, the weekends. I, I do long runs along Regent's Canal in kind of East London, and my son comes cycling with me. And we got in the morning, and we, run, we call it the party boat. There's a barge along Regent's Canal. And we, we're there at 9 or 10 in the morning. I mean, these guys are on the boat still going strong. They, they, we kind of know each other. They wait to us. They go, hey, it's a white guy, I'm running guy. And we go, hey, it's party guys. And, you know, in my prime, in my 20s, I, I, at 3 in the morning, I was up, I was, I was doing really well. There's no way I could dance till 9 in the morning. And you see them dancing at nine in the morning. I, I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong. I haven't checked them. I can't see any way to dance till nine in the morning and still be partying unless you're injecting drugs. The second major class, and this is a major one for us, the cannabinoids. And these are major for us because cannabis is major for us. And once again, we face this challenge, and we often get that in the clinic, where my friend Bob smokes every day and he's fine. Well, good for Bob. Bob wasn't sectioned. Bob didn't have problems with paranoia. And your friend Tim drinks lots of alcohol and, and, and it's causing him problems. So it depends on the drug, it depends on how you consume it, it depends on the person. So once again, most people who consume cannabis are not harmed by it. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend anything that could be harmful to you. But that's the truth about it. Some people, it may be therapeutic. That's fine. And for some people, it does cause harms. We know this. You will often hear people talk about spice with this group. I tend not to use the phrase, spice was an early type of this class. So well, you, you patients will use it, people in the public. The phrase I would tend to use would be novel cannabinoid or scra. Scra, even if you don't use it, we're having heard the word scra. Scra means synthetic cannabis receptor agonist. And they modulate the endocannabinoid system, which involves a neuron homeostasis and immune responses. And it, THC, which is the active ingredient, as you know, of traditional cannabis, it's a partial agonist of the receptor, produces slightly different effects, it produces a feeling of being stoned, which is pleasure, that's why people smoke cannabis. Now that's a really key fact there, that THC is a partial agonist. The scras have some really important differences from <coughs> cannabis. The synthetics have important differences. As the name suggests, they are entirely synthetic. They have nothing to do with the plants. They wouldn't rec recognize the cannabis plant in a horticultural lineup. They're, they're just invented in a lab. They're crystals, and they get dissolved in liquids. And that liquid, you can do almost anything. As I said, you can put it under your tongue, put it in your eye. Do you know how people get it into your wards? You can put it on your clothes and walk past it. Put it on a book, eat page 204, it's great. <laughs> it's, it's, it, there's lots of great ways that you can get this past. So once again, if you think about the characteristics of the drug, you can see its appeal to people. So if you grow your own for your own middle class, get together for some wine and cannabis, you don't have to worry about getting in on books. So for people who are forced to conceal it, this makes this very potent group of drugs very attractive, hard to detect. They are full agonists at cannabis receptors, CB1 receptor. And 
But cold spot, they tend to produce a much more potent picture. So again, THC is a partial agonist. It depends on the individual scrap. There's several hundred of them. There are probably some very weak strains out there. We won't see them. Like people smoking low, low percentage THC cannabis, they're probably not going to become psychotic unless they have a, a high loading and other factors. So there are probably quite weak variants out there. There are also some really, really potent uh, novel cannabinoids. Some of the fifth generation scrabs, you, you physiologically can't smoke enough traditional cannabis to hit the receptors in the same way. It's impossible. They're so potent. And they produce a different pictures. So in a sense, they hit the same system, so people will get a stone effect. We did a, we got some national lottery funding a little while ago, and we did a, a documentary, but we did a, a, a charity thing with a charity where we spoke to some homeless people about their use of spice. You can still get, I think if you Google it, it's still online. We use it as an educational resource where they'll talk about what it feels like to be on spice, including some of the scary parts of it. And we use that as an educational resource for patients, because again, not everyone wants to hear from a guy in a suit, so it's good to hear from people who've been through it. And you often get agitated. So when, when I mentioned about my friend who I was going to bring in who smokes cannabis, I mean, you're thinking, okay, maybe he's paranoid, he'll probably be fine and sit there, he'll be hungry, get him some food, he'll be okay. But what you can see with the novel cannabinoids is sometimes a really aggressive, agitated picture. And I don't, again, I'm, I'm, I'll be curious when we have a discussion at the end to hear what's happening locally. So the things, a couple of things really strike me with it. One is, I'm a home treatment team consultant, but we, I work in the same base as the inpatient unit. Uh, but guys will go out for, for leave for, you know, 15 minute break and they'll come in really agitated in a way that they never did a can. I mean, they come in before honking of cannabis, eyes be watering with it, but they didn't come back with the same clinical picture. And, may, and so sometimes in the ward, you think they're not responding to medication. I think they're definitely using it. It's not helping them get better. We're seeing a very acutely different picture with some of the use of scrubs. People coming in very agitated, very aggressive. I have friends in PICU who call me because they know it's an area of interest to me, and they'll say, well, we're, we're going through the usual algorithm of treatment. We can't bring this guy down. He's really agitated and some aggression with it, and a hangover state for some people. And what's interesting and a challenge for us as clinicians is some people with this are proving harder to treat. And again, I, I don't know if you've experienced James on the NPU that some of these guys come in, but it, pharmacologically it seems really hard to manage some of the symptoms. So we're getting an acute disturbance, it can be hard to manage. Another thing we're seeing in some people, it's a minority and we don't have good data yet, and again I'll be interested to know if you've seen it, we're getting more and more anecdotes of I'm seeing guys 19, 20, 21 using scrabs and we're getting, it sounds very pejorative, but I can only describe as quite a burnt out picture of psychosis where I might expect after 25 years going through rehab, not a cognitive impairment, we're getting with quite young people and we're looking at long term residential placement for people early 20s, whereas I might predict that for some maybe in their, in their mid 40s and the only difference we can see with some of these is that there's been consistent use of scrabs. Now again, it's anecdotal at the moment, but it seems to be a problem. And the follow-on for that that worries me, I, it, it feels it's the case, is a generation of kids who are exposed to this. Now, what's interesting is if you give most kids, so this, this is an argument in favor of decriminalization, if you give most people the option of regular cannabis or scrubs, 99% will go for regular cannabis. The same point of view, if I offer you a glass of wine or 10 in super strength, most people would go for a glass of wine. People will tend to self-moderate. But there are young people who have a generational cohort approaching us in slow motion who are going to develop psychoses from the scrubs that are going to be quite profound, quite difficult to treat, that it's going to look dif different. And I do wonder with some of these younger guys coming through with that kind of rehab pattern to them, and again, I don't mean that in a dismissive way to say that, that we're going to see more of that. I, and although we don't have good data, and I can't prove that's going to happen, I would find the reverse argument to be strange. If we think about a neurodevelopmental path and we think about young brains, I mean, you really don't want people taking drugs before the age of 25. Well, prefrontal cortex is still myelinating and association cortex is still forming, but that's when people take drugs. And I would find it strange if this more potent class didn't produce a greater rate of psychosis and it didn't look a bit different. So we have to wait and see, but it is a concern. And that's what they often look like. So, you know, I'm sure they're out there. You know the posh tea bags that people have? They have those, these kind of foil patterns or packets. This one fascinates me. Can you see the middle? Wait, who, who sees that and thinks, you know what my brain needs? A nuclear explosion. <laughs> two, two packs of that, please. On the right is, that, that I'm showing you, it's, it's typically rolled as a joint. That's, that's not a scrub. That's a, a herbal smoking mix. 
and spread onto it. But drug consumption often has culture that goes with it. So the drug culture around cannabis is smoking, so people like smoking. In, in the same way, for me, I consume alcohol, and there's a cultural bit that goes with it. So I like to hear, and, but I mean, I can, as soon as I hear that, great. And so there's often a, a, people's preference for consuming can vary from drug to drug. There's an edible form of alcohol available called alcohol. Have you heard of this? Powdered alcohol. It's, yeah, it's not popular. I don't want a martini. So you're used to if you if you consume a drug, you typically are used to it in a certain way, and you don't like variation. But that's that's it's most commonly smoked. How are we doing for time? I'm going to do more quickly now. I'm going to go through the other two classes. The main two classes for us are the stimulants and the cannabinoids. I've already mentioned depressants. At the moment, they're not a big problem. At the moment, and it's still to be seen. There are two groups of them: benzodiazepines and opioids. Now you know benzos. There are novel benzos out there, so there are NPS benzos, but there don't seem to be that many. No one's quite sure why. The working assumption is we have enough already. The marketplace is full. We've got from lorazepam to temazepam. Whatever you need with benzo, we've got a few. And there's actually not a marketplace for this. You could argue that the other ones but maybe, but no one's quite sure. So the novel benzos are around, they don't seem to be that popular. The novel opioids are not quite here yet. But this is causing a major problem in the US, and I'm sure you're aware of the US opioid crisis, where it's 100,000 deaths per annum. A lot of differences in the US, a lot of them are prescribed, they have a different prescription culture, so things like oxycodone we don't do here. Some of them are the novel opioids. I'm going to say this twice to you. Some of the novel opioids, the carfentanil, is up to 10,000 times more potent than heroin. 10,000 times more potent. And I know you're not substance use specialists, but you know with heroin, you kind of got to get the dose right. And the commonest time of death from it is when people come out of prison because their tolerance has dropped and they say, I, I, I consume X pound of heroin, I would like that now, and they inject and they die because they've been away from it six months. This is 10,000 times more potent. You got to be fairly careful with this stuff. This is killing lots of people, huge amounts. You will know if it gets here because the Prime Minister will be talking about it in front of the nation. You won't dodge that into it. You'll be out talking about it because there'll be a national crisis. It's not clear if it's going to get here. Drugs are often endemic, so you can think about things like PCP, phencyclidine, uh, angel dust, that was big in the East Coast of the US in the 90s, never really got here. Crystal meth varies, so maybe it won't, but we'll see. And the last class, which I won't dwell on because for time, are the hallucinogens, because you don't see them. You really, your wards are not full of people taking LSD. That stuff's a myth. You will occasionally see it. And actually, of colleagues in Australia, it seems to be a big problem there. And the other class here are dissociatives like ketamine. That's a problem for many people. You probably won't see it. Our BMJ papers, we did it with a colleague who's a toxicologist and guys. He sees it because of the cardiovascular problems. He's getting people dumped in the ED at the weekend. You probably won't see it. It's not unimportant, but it's probably not going to cross your path so much. If you are interested, you can go back again to the BMJ papers on that. So it brings us to the last part, in the last kind of 10 minutes, and we have maybe five or so minutes of questions. What to do with it? And I often go back to this graph from David Nutt, who was the chair of the ACMD, and then he got fired. Remember he came out with this statement about it's more dangerous to ride a horse than take ecstasy, which is true, but it's one of those unpalatable things. And you know, I'm sure he knew in advance. It's not the type of thing in that position to say out loud. You know, he was chair of that, that committee. But this paper from his from the Lancet, which I think is fantastic, on the x-axis is how harmful is a drug to the person who's consuming. So the further along here, the more problems you will have if you take it. And on the y-axis is how harmful is the drug to everyone around you if you take it. Can you read that? There we have society's most dangerous drug. So that's called a statistical outlier here, right? We've got a line of best fit going through. That's nearly on the previous slides. If it was invented now, it would be banned instantly as the scourge of Britain. And in fact, it would be the only drug that would be easy to ban, because the dealers would go around with six packs, you'd just you'd see them immediately. <laughs> People say, what's the deal with this alcohol stuff? Terrible. But again, drug laws are often based around culture about what we find acceptable. To make somebody feel bad, there's tobacco. And we can look at it here, so once again we come to how do drugs harm us. So we, think, we often think of the sharp edge of the wedge, we think about death. But here we've got all the ways of breaking down. So intimate partner violence, loss of employment, loss of opportunity, loss of education. Alcohol is number one in everything. On the right, mushrooms, 
Main danger is environmental from digging up forests and stuff. Don't take guts, but they're not all the same. And it takes us on to this challenge now. So what are we going to do? So again, we're going to come back to uncomfortable messages. So there is an uncomfortable message for many people. Taking drugs is fun. And you know why people take drugs? Because it's fun. For most people. Yes, for many people, it's a problem. Like alcohol. People drink alcohol because they enjoy the taste and it's a social part of their life. And some people take alcohol because they're addicted to it. And some people don't drink alcohol at all. So it's within that realm. Drugs are fun for lots of people. You need to be able to handle it. And you can't be this person. I just robbed that from the internet, that's fake. My son will tell me it's a meme. It's like, you, you can't be that person as a clinician saying, if you take drugs, you go to hell and you will definitely become addicted and you will definitely, because that's not true. And if you say that, either you don't know what you're talking about or you're lying. I don't know which one's worse. But people you're talking to will know that. Conversely, that's a real ad. It's in the 70s, not I do that anymore. And then, you know, I look at that and that I don't think they're conveying the fact that this is about the most dangerous drug ever invented. I'm susceptible, I look at that and I fancy a smear you know, so How do you hold those things in your head at the same time? The fact that people want to do it, we can't be that, we can't, and yet we have a sense as clinicians, we don't want to promote it. Well, I think you just need to be able to be those things. You need to hold that complexity. And it's the same with alcohol. You, you get it, people say, yeah, I bet you like a drink. You think, well, we're not going to engage. That's not the argument we have. Or we're talking about ways or dying. We're going to talk about helping you. But you do need to be able to hold the flex. So what do you do? You're going to see it. If you're not seeing it already, you're definitely going to see it. And sometimes it might be anecdotal, and sometimes it stays anecdotal. I take drugs sometimes. What, is it a problem? I don't think so. I took methadrone once. I'm not really into it. Fine. It might be part of a substance misuse profile, some of specialist services, and acute intoxication, probably more the ED or junior doctors. And for us, most commonly, as a precipitant or perpetuating factor for mental health. At the moment, the data are fairly limited, but break it down by the parent class. If you think about NPS stimulants, what do you know about cocaine? If you're thinking about cannabinoids, what do you know about cannabis? With the caveats that they can be more harmful. But my experience has been that substance use services will take on people with, with these harms a few years ago. I think they struggle to know what to do like the rest of us. But my experience is they're really underfunded and there's not enough of them and they've lots to do already, so it's a difficulty. It's, the answer isn't more drug services. I'm sure that's one answer that drug services would like. But the answer is this is your problem. These are the people you see. You can't just say, I'm not saying, oh, wait a second, you've, you've no fixed you've no fixed boat. I don't see people with that. I'm a psychiatrist. You see people with lots of different things in their life and you accept it as part of your world. This is part of your world. What I would want in an assessment, again, I don't know how clear this is, you're welcome to the slide. This in a sense, I don't teach you how to suck eggs, but an assessment from with NPS, the, the obvious things in a sense, rather than NPS, I would try and break it down by category. Now, once again, people won't always be honest with you. People don't always know what they take, and believe it or not, sometimes drug dealers lie. Sometimes drug dealers don't know what they're selling to you. But you try and break it down. Are they drugs like ecstasy? Are they drugs like cannabis? Is it like heroin? How do you take it? How often do you take it? So once a week, once a day, once a year? Got acute and chronic harm, so is it affecting your physical health? Is it affecting your psychological health? Are there safeguarding issues? Are the kids around? Are you vulnerable? Are you being exploited? Are you exploiting other people? How much is this costing you? And then I'm not a psychologist, but the problem is the frames approach for, for substance use. And for me, frames are really about not being the big hands. About saying, well, look, you're telling me it's an issue. Can I, how can I help you with it? I'm not there to cause you problems. If you're saying it's an issue, where are you trying to get to? And can I help you get there? Rather than making judgments about it. I mean, that to me is frames summed up. Because people are used to a big finger. And they used to say, I told you not to. You're on an antipsychotic and you're smoking that. I mean, try not to be, you feel it. But are you trying not to be that person? Some few final messages before we have maybe questions on it. Generally, acute intoxication just requires reassurance. If someone comes back from leave and they've taken an NPS, sit them down and get them a cup of tea. In risk assessment, they throw tea at people, don't do that. But just sit them down and talk to them. I would take their ALPS, their blood pressure, their pulse. I mean, if, if their blood pressure starts, do use an antipsychotic. We don't have a huge amount of information. And like I say, there is a concern that some of the more potent scrabs are not resolving quickly to antipsychotics. Your drug tests are of limited use. So it, it always amuses me, which will tell you more about me than about anything else. It takes about two years to make a urinary drug test. So if someone runs in now and gives us one, says this is the latest urinary drug test, 
Typically, that would have been manufactured based on drugs up until November 2017. Now we're two years out of date, and 200 new drugs have been synthesized. So I'll tell you why, I mean, this, this part that amused me is that one of the ways you can make urinary drug tests is they inject the drugs into sheep. Sheep develop antibodies to it, and then they get the reagent strips that pick it up. I just find it amusing. I had this image of some field in Wales, all these sheep just looking at the sun. <laughs> and you know, if I was a sheep, that would be the life for me. <laughs> Far better than turn into mutton chops. So that's how they make them. So right now there are some sheep doing their bit for Britain. Okay, but we gotta wait. Having said that, I would use them, uh, its grip on your unit, in the same way that you don't allow alcohol. So you have a policy that you reserve the right to test it. But you've got to have some, I suppose, hesitation about the sensitivity and specificity. There's lots of clever work going on trying to find common molecules that will identify that not got there yet. The one guaranteed way to get tested accurately is if you die, the coroner will find out. So if you really want to know what's in your system, you've got to die. So that's the only way at the moment. But I would still recommend you're in your drug test. And on that, I'll start. I think I've got about five or six minutes for questions, but thank you for listening.